Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. The first generation of Christians probably prayed something similar. But they may have had a slightly different understanding than we have. Christ has died. They were there. Christ has risen. They were there or heard directly about it. Christ will come again. They had more of an expectation of Christ will come again in their own lifetime. The early writings of Paul sort of reinforce this a little bit. It takes a while before the letter to the Ephesians comes along and he talks about from generation to generation in the church. So there's a, a dawning process that just may be what is sent as the advocate, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, is going to be a little bit different than we expected. It's as if the first generation of Christians were saying, okay, the advocate, the comforter, the Holy Spirit is going to just get us over the hump until Jesus comes again. And... Then something happened. <clears throat> Babies are born. People die. And as time went on, it became clear that generation to generation just might be more long term. Now we can take a look at this in terms of how scripture unfolds and is written. It's not simply in the order that we get it in the Bible, especially the New Testament. Right? The writings of Paul are probably the earliest Christian writings. So when we hear Paul write and work out, we've got a sense of where that first generation of Christians is. And then we get the gospel according to Mark, which is written before the fall of the temple in 70 or 72. And now there's a compilation of who Jesus is. They're beginning to say, we better remember some of this and keep our stories pretty straight. And then after the fall of the temple, we have Matthew and Luke come along and they draw on many sources the same as Mark, but they also add to it. They add to it with a narrative about Jesus' birth. Kind of now setting a stage of deeper understanding of Jesus. And Luke, in particular, is the one who really keeps us on focus about this ascension and then the coming of the Holy Spirit. And that leads us into the Acts of the Apostle text that we hear today. The Acts of the Apostles is very much a continuation, if you will, of the Gospel according to Luke. So now we have a group really trying to hold on to get an idea of what is the meaning for them as this time when Jesus is going to come again seems much farther into the future than they realize. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. They're now remembering and anticipating. And so it's important for that early community to then really try to hold on to what was it like on that day when the Spirit descended and it was remembered as if tongues of fire, flames, jumped off the top of the heads of the disciples who were there, the apostles. They had done the hard work. They had elected Matthias to take the place of Judas Iscariot. They were ready and they received this gift and they could talk to anybody. All those unpronounceable names that show up in the Acts of the Apostles. Parthians and Medes, etc., etc. Now, there's something that links and makes it possible for them to speak to one another. But I will also posit this for you. What is God doing here? And what's another thing that they're remembering? 
If you recall the Tower of Babel story from the Old Testament, here we have humanity full of hubris. We can go up and capture God. Let's build a tower and go get God. Because in those days, everybody spoke the same language and they could work closely together. So as they built this thing, they forgot one thought. God is indeed all-powerful, and God said, oh, you yeah, think you're so smart? Try communicating when you have different languages. And of course, the whole thing falls apart, and that was just an early understanding of where language comes from, but also about hubris. Now, humility is an action which is the flip of hubris meaning being open to. It's something you can aspire to, but never really claim. And yet, the disciples on the day of Pentecost, there's a humility there because they're open to listening to God. And God blesses them and says, now the Tower of Babel is corrected because the language you're going to speak is the language of love that you have received in Jesus Christ. And if you share that love, all will understand you. And as an added bonus, right now you can all speak the same language, whatever is showing up. And you can begin to see how that begins to correct and God's power and activity starts to show up. And they begin to say, we, we can take this forward. Now in our timeline of when scripture is written, we have to now remember about the gospel according to John. That little strange gospel which seems so different than Mark or Matthew or Luke. And yet in it, because it is written perhaps about 20 years after Matthew and Luke, so maybe even early 90 AD, some scholars would say, they're trying to really get their heads around the Jesus event, but also around how they're supposed to act as Christians. It's as if they're trying to find some sense of what is our mission. If we're going to be here from generation to generation, and it's going to be a while before Jesus shows back up, we better figure out how we're going to act. And so they start remembering things like, all right, we need to be in good relationship. And what's the relationship with Jesus? Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Ah, that helps. What else do we need to remember? Well, in the Gospel according to John, Philip has some great moments with Jesus. We typically remember Peter's great moments with Jesus because Peter at times is a real chowderhead and finally gets it and comes around. Well, Philip is the kind of guy, I don't know about you, but I always liked having a Philip in any class I was in because Philip would be the one who, either for lack of guile or whatever, was always the one who would ask the question all of us were afraid to ask because we looked foolish asking the question. And so we'd always hope he'd be the one to ask the question. And guess what? He does. Philip asks the question of Jesus, and it's kind of remembered. You can see how the early church is remembering this. It's kind of like, well, Jesus, what's going to happen? When you go away, you've told us you're leaving. And so Jesus patiently and lovingly starts to explain it to him. But it, it kind of sounds like this in my interpretation. Jesus is basically saying, Philip, I've shown you lots of stuff. We're linked with God. There's love. Now, I want to tell you one more thing. Now, this is going to kind of blow your mind, Philip. So get ready for it. Remember, Jesus is saying this to everybody who was afraid to ask the question. Greater works than the ones that I've been doing, you will do. And I can see Philip going, how is that possible? You're Jesus. How could I possibly do greater works than you? And, and, and I basically can almost see Jesus taking his hand and saying, Philip, come a little closer and doing that sort of stage whisper and saying, Philip, do the math. There will be so many more of you out there. In essence, as Paul writes, the body of Christ. You will be out there in my name. And an advocate. 
the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, you can see how they link that to how they're going to go out and live into the mission of sharing this great love. That they're not on their own. Now for us, today, as we contend with Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again, we've got 2,000 years of experience to say, well, where are you? Well, there's an already and a not yet. You are here, but you're not fully here, but yet you're fully present in the power of the Holy Spirit. How can we make that love known? How can we bring, make heaven available on earth? And so for us as Episcopalians in our prayer book, we do have an action that we take that we will take this morning. We will restate, we will renew our baptismal vows. We will say those five promises that follow our restatement of the Apostles' Creed. And those five statements, those promises, are like mission statements for us to guide us, but they also remind us of something that we need. It's the humility that we need. We say, I will with God's help. Now, our church is beautifully decorated today for Pentecost. I really want to thank Elder Ann and Ruth for stepping up to the challenge of what could we do to sort of set the church apart a little bit for Pentecost and for the UTO in-gathering. And what they've done with these marvelous uh, crepe ribbons throughout the church and the flowers and whatever, uh, Elder Ann sees the ones at the altar, the way the spines come up as if that's part of the ascension. I really like this understanding of how this building is so alive for us. We have the red of Pentecost, the descent of the spirit, the flames, also reminding us of the cost of discipleship, the blood. But we have the blue, too, which is associated with UTO, which is another form of us living into our mission as Christians, which we will pray more fully after we restate our baptismal covenant, after the announcements. And when the ingathering is brought in, that is a public <coughs> statement of how we're living and caring for not only those nearby, but those around the world. We are really preparing for Christ to come again by being fully present and ready for him in the way we act as the body of Christ now. The way we have entered into and, and, and celebrated the generations to generations that have brought us to this moment to allow us and to help us be ready to offer this level of service. So as we remember the descent of the Spirit, we are in very much the same place as the early Christians. Always trying to listen carefully, for listening is the essential component of humility. Listening carefully to what God would have us do. And to remember that we are never doing it alone. For in the power of the Holy Spirit, it is that is how we receive God's help. The Apostle Paul said as much in his writings to the Ephesians in a prayer that closes morning prayer and is one that is near and dear to us. Glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. All these words I offer in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.